Hi there, my name is Brian Kelly and in this talk I'll give my experiences of planning an interrail trip based upon two recent interrail journeys myself and my wife took. So a subtitle for this it might be how interrailing in your 60s is different from interrailing in the 60s and I will focus on some of the technological developments which have changed over time. This presentation is freely available for use by others and sharing. In a previous video, I gave, I made a video of our trip to Spain, seeing the, the various places in Scandinavia, and then some of the stations, the crowded ones, the more empty ones. And in this, I'll talk about the planning and in particular, aspects of getting reservations, different ways of getting reservations. A bit about me, I helped set up at first UK University website and spent 17 years as a national web advisor. Enjoy traveling, but I'm now retired. And based on my long-standing IT expertise, I'm happy to use IT and learn new apps, have some project management expertise, which given me an understanding of the complexities of interrailing into technical interoperability across a range of different rail booking systems, different countries, different legal frameworks, different cultural environments and the like. And I also have a community of IT experts who can help advise me in discussions about some of those IT issues. About you, you may be thinking about taking an interrail trip and perhaps confused about stories you've heard, particularly regarding reservations. Uh, it might be concerns about risks, but excited about the opportunities. Maybe wondering what you should take with you and uncertain as to how you'll use your smartphone, which I suspect many of you will take with you. So this talk is based upon my first interrail trip to Scandinavia and then after three to four weeks back we went on our second to Spain. So I'll talk about the planning process, the project management approach I took and then how we went on our holidays and adapted our plans um, and the lessons learned. Uh, the video is one of the trains coming back, it gives you a feel for what it was like on the train, um, how people back then were, many of them were wearing masks on the train, which might be mandatory in some places, although not everybody thought necessarily followed the, the rules. Um, our first ever trip came after I spotted the ad, four day, of, four day flash sale of 50% of tickets. And that was a great opportunity for myself and my wife to have a much needed holiday, the offer was one month pass or three months pass for only about £100 more than the one month. What a bargain, I thought, particularly when I discovered there were additional discounts if you're over 60 and discounts on the first class travel. So we bought two three month first class tickets, passes for £410 each. We were excited and then we thought, right, what do we do? Let's start planning and that was the interesting thing. So we thought about what we wanted. So I come across some people have said they want to go away for three months from their home country. They want to, um, you know, see how far they can travel on the trip, maximize the distances, perhaps on a single day or whatever. So people will have different objectives. We had to decide what to do and when to go, plan what we needed to do before setting off and then what we did on the trip itself. So I'll be covering those key points in my talk. So what we wanted was to see interesting places and stay at reasonable hotels. Uh, so we weren't being macho about it. We weren't being uh, having those really luxurious hotels, but also not just budget hotels, reasonable hotels. And we were also wanted to see how we'd react to significant time away from home, the longest for, for both of us. Um, thinking about exploring possibilities for uh, future holidays, perhaps off to Australia in a year or so's time. 
So how did we decide what to do? Well, we, we agreed jointly on the key places we wanted to go. And then I did the detailed project management, uh, the, the routes, the time spent, the places and the time spent in the different places and the hotels. We decided we wanted to go in mid to late August. It was not too hot. Um, but it was reasonable up in Scandinavia, not too cold up in Scandinavia at that time. And obviously before we set off, we needed to look at the travel insurance, COVID documents, face masks, uh, the health card, the European health card. Then there was stuff that we needed to buy to take away with us, the stuff we needed to take. And then the stuff we, did, we decided not to take because our luggage was getting too heavy. Um, so getting started, so it was in July time we started to do the, the detailed um, planning. So we decided we'll set off on the 17th of August. It was a time my niece was staying with me. So she could, we could have some that time with her and then she could give us a lift to the station. Um, and then she could come back and stay at ours for a few days after we'd gone. And then we set away and we'd be away for three to four weeks. So that was a the plan. Then we discovered that Eurostar was full and people were saying, well, yes, it's the summer holiday. It's an opportunity to get away after lockdown. Everybody's getting the cheap tickets, all of those type of issues. And then I found there were some additional complications around that time. It was challenges in booking reservations. Even after you got to mainland Europe, there were some challenges in particular in Germany, the tra many of the trains were full because there were some cheap rates for commuters in, in Germany over th a three month period. So what happened? We changed our start date for our first uh, journey and we set off on the 30th of August. So a couple of weeks later than we'd originally planned, but we were away for three weeks, two days. And we decided two main goals. I was keen after speaking to a friend who says the Oslo to Bergen train route is great. So we decided to do that. And my wife was keen on going to Copenhagen after we both enjoyed the Bergen series on BBC4. So we both, that was two of the uh, three of the main places and other places would fall out after that. So going to those two places meant that um, Stockholm would be sensible and I was like to go back and see the Vasa uh, Ship Museum again. So those were our big aims and then go into the detail planning. So I devised the route and what we said we'll have four to six hours would be a typical length of a travel journey. We try and stay near a station, a hotel accommodation near a station, so it wouldn't be too far to walk with our with our with our rucksacks. Um, so this was the plan. The first hotel, sorry, the first uh, Eurostar to Lille, we booked a couple of weeks before, as I've said, and we also booked hotels in Lille uh, in advance when I was at home. And we booked the reservations in Germany before I set off as well. And I'll talk about that a bit later on. So that's really what we did in advance. And we had a plan up to going to Bergen. So we estimated that would be about two weeks. And then I made some budget estimates. So basically looked at some hotels. So I might search for a hotel in Stockholm near the station on a particular date and look at the range of prices and that would help to give us an estimation, an estimate of the, the of the total. So that was a plan. And then plans you need to to tweak, which is fine. So when we were in Germany and things were going fine and we knew we could get the trains to Germany and then on to Copenhagen, that wasn't a problem. So we says, right, well, Copenhagen seems great. Let's spend three nights there, which was great. And we also wanted three nights in Stockholm. We decided that three nights was a, a better length of time to stay in places. So we tweaked on our, on our route. Um, but then, and initially was going to have just a one night in Oslo because I was keen on going to Bergen. 
but the train from Stockholm to Oslo took about seven hours. We got in, you know, it'll be after 6 p.m. when we got into the hotel and the initial plan was the next morning to get the train and we were too tired. So I went back to the station and got a different reservation. So we'd have two nights. That meant I had to get another hotel. It wasn't possible to stay in the same hotel. So we moved to a, a hotel which was actually near the station. Um, but that's what we did. And because of that, it meant we only had one night in Bergen because of the next um, mode, mode of travel, which I'll talk about a bit later on. But as you can see, that's what we did. Um, there were some tweaks. And at one stage, we were thinking of going to, to Flam, uh, getting off at one station, and then going on a ferry down a field, which looks really, really beautiful. But it was a bit longer and it'd be an extra night in Flam staying somewhere and we decided no we'll just stay on the train all the way to Bergen. So that's what we did. That's the plans and how the plans were adapted. We used the travel app for planning uh, our trips and, and options, confirming journeys and recording journeys and statistics. As you can see from this, we went from Crookern, London, Lille, Cologne, Bremen, Copen uh, Stockholm, Copenhagen, Oslo, and of those three days trips, we had places we stayed an extra night, but on Bergen we had a night fewer than originally planned. Then we got a ferry to Hertzstals and then made our way back home through the Netherlands. And we planned the first bit, and then it was while we were away on holiday we made a decision as to where we would go on the route back home. So <clears throat> I explained how some of these things change. So um, we, at one stage, we thought we'd go, looked at going directly from the tip, northern tip of Denmark to Groningen, but that was far too long a journey. So we stopped off at Aarhus, which was a fantastic place. Then we again looked at from our host to Groen again, but that would decided that was too long a 10 hour journey. So we actually went to Rottenburg to break the journey and have a, a rest day. So we discovered that it was sensible to have rest days. We didn't have to maximize the number of museums and river cruises and, and, and the like for continually for three weeks. So that's what we did. When I was planning, it said the ferry, we got a discount on the ferry with the Interrail Pass, by the way. The ferry would arrive at eight o'clock. It was arrived a bit later than that. And then there was some difficulties. The shuttle bus to the um, next train station was late. So we got the 11.50 train and we only arrived at the station five minutes before that. Uh, but because this was just a local train, we didn't need reservations in advance. And I could just select the um, that particular trip on the Interrail app as we got on the train and used the train Wi-Fi network. So this is how they it, you use that Interrail app. So as well as planning and confirming uh, recording, you have a, a daily ticket for showing and spanning, scanning. Uh, there were two parts. I hadn't realised this. So initially I thought this was what you had and they guard would just scan that QR code but then one of them uh, scrolled down and I discovered there was this bit which had the details of of the journey so this is where I realized that I had to make sure that both journeys were on included on there if you if you're on one and fail to do the other I didn't know what might happen but anyway that's something that's worth checking I should say that people have said that if there's not a Wi-Fi network when you get to the station or on the train, you might be able to um, go into airplane modes and there'll be a cash version of the daily pass. But on the, when we got up on our final day in a hotel, I would initiate the pass for the day. That was the routine I got into. There were other travel apps which are really need needed. Um, some of them will have better rates for deal for de for trips or more comprehensive timetables, particularly for short scale local journeys. 
So here was one. It'll say and view your tickets, and you can have, you can show the conductor uh, your e-tickets, or it might be if you wanted a, a PDF, a paper version, if you wanted to print it out and, and use that. We didn't print out anything while we were on our journeys, but we did. I did um, at home with a couple of the tickets. And this was a Eurostar when we were going from Brussels to uh, St Pancras. And you'll notice there's a, a code, a barcode on these. And that made me realise the importance of having a, a phone and screen work that you can imagine. Um, you, um, if, the, if the QR, if the barcode was on your phone, the guard might not be able to scan it if there was a cracked screen. So something just to be aware of. <coughs> and so what I tried to do was install and register on these various apps and register on their websites in advance on the home Wi-Fi for security reasons I'll explain a bit later on. Um, and reservations. Big topic on Facebook. Somebody posts and says any regrets and one person says not do more research on the whole booking of reservations in advance. So here are my experiences. So I booked the Eurostar on the 2nd of August. So that was when I knew I couldn't go on the 17th and the first date was the 29th, but decided to go on the Wednesday because that was a better day, midweek people say. So I got the Eurostar reservations that cost 40 euros. I also installed the, one of the train apps, bought the reservations to Cologne and from Cologne to Bremen um, and that was on the 10th of August. So this was a couple of weeks, three weeks or so uh, before we set off. Um, the reservations were obviously very, very cheap. Um, so that was what we did in advance when we were actually traveling and in particular on the second trip to Spain, I tend to buy the reservations at a station when I had a few days um, to avoid the, the queues um, and that all worked fine. I did notice when we went from Cologne to Bremen and we changed trains at Hamburg that there were huge queues at the ticket office in Hamburg. So I'm glad I did that in advance. Um, we were also traveling through Germany after the cheap tickets in Germany was over. So it was a bit better than if you'd have hit it in the summer. And some concerns, both real and imaginary. Um, for our second trip to Spain, I must admit, I was confident we'd made our first trip and everything went fine. Uh, so I thought, I know what I'm doing, but Spanish booking system is different from Scandinavian Germany. So I booked the reservation to Lille and then to Lyon online at home a few, about a few days or a week before we traveled and when I tried to get the second reservation from, from Lyon to Girona the booking app says sorry you can open, there are only paper reservations available for that particular route and there's no time to post it to your house and I thought oh, I didn't expect to have postal physical copies of reservations so I, initially I thought ah if we can only get to Lyon, we might have to stay in Lyon for a few days until we're able to get the next ticket down to Girona. But at the ticket office, this was the, the ticket office shown up here, I was able to buy the paper reservation and there were no queues there. I actually went and spoke to a person who was just in the corner there and asked about reservations in general for coming back. And I was told that reservations can be, can, they, they can go. Um, there might be limits on the reservations for interrail travellers. So it's best to get them as far in advance as possible. And I said, OK, so can I have rev reservations uh, from uh, to Lille and then on to, uh, to Lyon and then on to Lille for a couple of weeks time? And he checked and says, no, we have none available on the day I wanted. I said, what about the next day? says none for that. So it was two days later, um, which wasn't a problem because, well, I'm um, now retired and have no time constraints. Although the one concern I did have was we starting to hit the date of the proposed train strikes back in the UK. 
So that was a bit of a worry, although in fact the, uh, res the strikes were postponed for a, for a few weeks, so we well, didn't have any problems with trains back in the UK. But the Spanish system was different. Well, that was the French system. <laughs> the Spanish system was also different. And he learned that get, get reservations online is not easy. And it's not really geared up for doing it. Somebody says, well, that's not quite true because um, travel agents have access and can get them, but just for an ordinary consumer, it's difficult, if not impossible, to get these reservations online. So when I arrived at Girona, we were three days or so in Girona, great place, by the way, and I went to the ticket office and says, I want to go from Girona to Valencia in a few days time and then three days after that I want to go to Zaragoza and then three days there and then on to Barcelona and then from Barcelona up to Lyon. Want to do to, want to do that. We got the told fine, small amount of money to pay and then I was told that uh, for one of the journeys to Valencia to Zaragoza I think um, you didn't need a reservation. So as I was paying for the reservations, I got my phone out and it says, it says mandatory reservations. So I showed my phone to the ticket office and he spoke to a colleague, had a bit of a chat and then get back to me and says, oh, really sorry, sir. Um, there is no first class compartment on that particular train. And he looked and obviously there are no first class reservations if there's no compartments and he thought that that meant there was it wasn't needed uh, and I said no I need a reservation so he gave me a reservation for second class and was quite apologetic but well, that was the type of things which can possibly go wrong so I'm glad that I didn't arrive at the station and found I couldn't get on the train because I didn't have a reservation he did tell me by the way that um, I was getting a slow journey between these two. He did tell me it was possible to arrive there more quickly, but that would involve a change of trains somewhere. And we wanted just to stay on a, a we're happy just with the slow train so that we didn't have to change. But anyway, the other thing somebody told me was that some of the stations in Spain are more like airport departure lounge. And this is a photograph of one of them. I think it's in Zaragoza. And as you see, your luggage it all has to go through and, and scan and there will be security officers who might frisk you if, if need be. Um, and that made me realise that these reservations, they had to be shown in order to get through into this system. So even if the train was empty, you needed the reservation in order to get onto the, to the platform. So it's a different purpose for the reservations. And we decided we need to get to the station early in case there were big queues or somebody was delayed getting the luggage through security. In fact, that wasn't an issue, but this was just a planning just in case. So what can go wrong? Confusions and concerns that people may have need to possibly expect and plan for the unexpected and the whole issues about planning and adapting plans and acceptance of how things are. But in particular, I'll mention the value of a community. Now, what concerns might you have about if you're planning a trip, say, to mainland Europe? These were some of the things which occurred to me. Um, Brexit wasn't an issue, didn't affect us in any way. There was obviously COVID issues and health issues, but we had our we'd have vaccinations, we had our COVID pass, which we never had to share. We had COVID masks, which we had to wear on German and Spanish railways, I think. We were both okay health-wise. My wife had a bit of a cold, but that's no big deal. These things happen when you go away, no big deal. Booking reservations, I've mentioned, that is a, an issue you need to understand. There were strikes, not only in the UK, but also in Germany but that didn't affect us. But obviously you would need to be adaptable if you are affected by strikes. Language issues, well, in um, Scandinavia, everyone understand, understood English. On the trains in, in Spain, um, 
uh, guards tended to, well, we didn't really need to, to, to speak to them, it was, was fine, but I did notice at one stage in Spain, I tried just to get a, a ticket, 10 minute journey just into town, but the interface was all in Spanish. And even when I clicked on the Union Jack for the English language version, it just showed one page in English and then went to Spanish. So I had no idea if I was booking the right ticket. So I ended up, I gave up on that idea and got the bus into town. But clearly there will be language issues. Uh, but what I'll do is look at some of these issues in a bit more detail, the whole technology issues, the money. Uh, did I leave the gas on? and the fear of missing out and loneliness, some of the softer type issues of travelling on the interrail. You may have read Around the World in 80 Days, perhaps when you were young, I know I did, or watched it more recently on TV. And if you have read it or watched it, you might remember the bit where Passport realised that he'd left the gas on while he was away. And Phineas Fogg said, it will burn at your expense, which he realised was actually more than he was he would earn while he was away for 80 days. And obviously, if he might have been worried about the price of gas back then, we are also worried about the crass price of gas and energy. But fortunately, we have something that was not available in Jules Verne time. We have remote act control over our smart thermostats so this was something i was pleased that i installed earlier on this year so i was able to control the switch the, the automatic water heating off and control the, the heating so it was off most of the time and then when i had a somebody came to stay i could switch it on while she was visiting our house and then the fear of missing out so there might be concerns that you're missing out on significant things which might be sad news and obviously the demise of Her Majesty the Queen was a sad occasion for many people. It was also a significant uh, time and so um, there's this sad news, there's bad news if there's terrorist attacks or if there's earthquakes or floods in, in places and the good news, um, the World Cup, whether rugby cricket or football might be things that you have an interest in and it might be things you have an interest in not only for back home but also the place you're at. I can recall being in Holland when the Netherlands beat the Soviet Union in the European Championships um, and that was a big day in Holland and everything was close, everything was quiet while everybody was watching the game. So if there is a World Cup and the place you're in, it get through to the final, what will that mean for the travel, for shops and opening hours, or you just might want to be part of the, the action and the like. So we can now find out access to information more easily with our connected devices. And prepare from the unexpected. I had uh, enjoyed going in Valencia to the aquarium. And of course, yes, they must clean the aquarium, but that wasn't quite how I expected it. And I had a similar uh, uh, unexpected unexpe incident when I was using, I got a Revolut uh, card and debit app, which I use for paying hotel bills. I topped it up with euros, so it minimised any uh, fees associated with uh, using different currencies and I used it just in a small purchases uh, in small uh, small shops so that was all fine I would recommend you get something like that there are lots of them available um, but with this card so I'd used it on a number of occasions and then I went to one place I think it was Barcelona and I was going to top up to pay a hotel bill and I got a message to say transactions declined because your postcode does is mismatched with what we have. And I tried again and I tried rebooted the phone and tried and tried the next day, but no joy. So I went to then use my main card um, to pay the hotel bill and that was declined. And so I started to worry about this unexpected thing. Um, but I rang the bank 
and I discovered, well, I googled and, then rang the, and I rang the bank and I discovered that the problem with postcodes was a known problem. Um, apparently, there's issues as to whether the postcode has got a, a space or a dash between the two parts or it's all one and that's treated differently in different countries, which might explain the things. Um, my, the person I spoke to said it shouldn't be a worry, that was just it was rejected. Um, and because I tried to transfer money on a number of occasions, the system spotted these irregularities and blocked use of the card. But as I was on the phone, I says, look, it's me. Can you please reset so I can pay things? And he did, so he, it was OK. And apparently they had sent, I'd received an automatic SMS message, but it hadn't quite arrived when I, when I noticed that. But, Preparing for what happens if you can't access money might be a thing to think about and, and plan for. And this issue about security then goes on to the using of Wi-Fi. So I used, I was happy to use open networks when I was out in town or in, in pubs and bars and checking menus and places to go. But I used the hotel network, which I'd logged in to um, using. Typically, they'd ask for your name and room number, and then you go on there. And then once I'm on there, I'd use that network for paying the hotel bills or transferring money. And I also have got a phone which has fingerprint authentication, so I didn't have to type in passwords. I tried to minimise typing in passwords and obviously being careful if I had to create a new password for a new app, I wasn't reusing an important password. This is mainstream advice. Everybody should know that. Uh, and I've since learned the value of, of VPN, a virtual private network, and also help if you input particularly concerned about security issues and ways of checking that the hotel network has a, a high standard of security um, against hacking and the like. Um, I also discovered, I hadn't realised this, that mobile data using 4G or whatever is more secure. I hadn't really thought about this because I was aware that um, since Brexit uh, we'd lost the uh, roaming across throughout the EU, although a number of phone companies do say that you can use your data in certain countries, uh, so it will be worth checking for that. So maybe using mobile data to just pay your bills uh, might be a sensible thing to do. Should you worry about these things? Well, when I spoke to my IT colleagues, they were saying, oh yes, this is really, really important. And of course, it's not just when you're interrailing. People can hack and do naughty things when you're in the UK. So these issues about learning a bit more about VPN and, and these techie protocols and using mobile data, something you should probably think about in any case and not just on the interrail. Finally, some other things. So we took taxis, a couple of taxis, we took the ferry, it was a discount um, for interrail travellers. We had a great trip up the funicular railway to Bergen. We didn't spend too much time in Bergen, but I was really pleased that we spent the, the morning that we had there to going up to the top. It was misty at the time, but then the clouds disappeared and we saw this great view. Question, how do you get into your hotel? Normally at the big hotels, obviously there'll be reception open 24 hours. But in Lille, we just had one night there and second trip. Before I arrived, I got a email with a QR code, which I printed out and it also is available on the phone. And so we got to the hotel and um, had to, for the QR code to, to be scanned. Initially, I tried to, I thought that was the reader, but it was actually down here. So took me a couple of hours before I worked that out. Uh, in Bergen, there was a magic key app I had to install, which used Bluetooth to open the main door and our room door. Incidentally, this hotel was on the fourth floor of a shopping mall and we didn't see any staff. So uh, there were also cheaper hotels. So. Then in Germany, we arrived there an hour beforehand and it was raining and there was nobody there. So I saw a phone number 
and I rang the owner who didn't speak English and I didn't speak German but I noticed I gave my name she knew Kelly she knew what room I was in and then she spoke five numbers which I didn't understand so she tried it in English and then I was able to open the key lock so that was one of the language issues but it was interesting the different ways of getting into to hotels besides the well-staffed um, reception desk fortunately I didn't need to have spur keys you can give another person access to the um, smart magic key app if needs be so there'll be additional things there for other people before I set off I bought a new phone which was great really pleased with it really pleased with the videos I took um, power bank which I could charge multiple devices with an adapter again which I could charge multiple devices with sling bag for carrying passports and tablets and uh, tablet computers and then a wallet to one of these RFID protection devices for my, whether it's needed or I don't know you can google that but that was something I got before I set off um, and communities so I after I got the tickets I discovered a Facebook group for interrailers and then one for interrailing for the older crowd who didn't really want to know where the late night discos and chief dormitories were and this has been really really great um, and so people would ask oh it's really confusing I just can't cope with it somebody said that and within an hour there have been 15 comments and now there's been many dozen of responses to that from people saying yes I agree with you or now here are some strategies for handling those concerns so that was a really really good group if you're not a Facebook fan there are reddit has something similar they come and ask questions and then the posts you can ask oh today or tomorrow so discounts and what you do if you let your pass at home and, and the like and details about reservations and night trains and the like so how would you manage without that if you were just on your own I, I don't know I don't know but it's really really good and then there's the digital memories so here are some memories that I have on the 6th of September we were in Copenhagen and we went for a walk and then we got the boat and I had a boat trip around uh, so and then 22nd of October had a fantastic time in Girona and it looks as though we had a long extended lunchtime meal uh, in a fantastic restaurant and then from uh, what was it three o'clock to six o'clock we had a wonderful time being shown around Girona so those were my digital memories and I want to have such memories but to be honest I'm getting forgetful and manually just going through a whole pile of photos and videos can be time consuming so I'm happy to make use of automated backup of media so my photos and videos are automatically uploaded to the cloud and they will know where I was and the time and timelines of my trips let me just show you what I mean by this so here was in Groningen we were on our way back we'd had a great holiday um, and uh, there was a really nice uh, coffee place and there it was uh, it's in my it was the 21st of September this was I'd left the hotel we were on our way to to Belgium before we went home and look it's telling me it was 8.30 I got there 9.15 the train left so I had about 40 minutes for a coffee and a breakfast and look that really nice coffee place is a Starbucks and it might be oh how embarrassing I went to a way to Europe and to Holland and I was in Starbucks if you're worried about such things you can actually remove details of embarrassing places that you've been to possibly McDonald's we brought a rucksack and a sling bag and that was fine uh, and conclusion somebody said can you share your experiences of things you might have done differently or things you might want to share with others that's what I've tried to do in this talk would I do it again 
Well, the answer is I did. I did Scandinavia. I went to Spain. It was great. Was it worth the hassle in the planning? Well, to be honest, it's not cheap <laughs> what, what we did. So if you're going to spend a lot of money, it's sensible to make plans. And planning can be fun and planning can save you money. Um, so it was worth it. And what would I do differently? Well, not a lot. Maybe check accommodation reviews more carefully. That's something people have, have spoken about on the various groups. Um, and in particular, Coral Musgrave, who's a spending a lot of time traveling at the moment she's got a blog i think on traveling coral she shared this summary i've learned which i could apply to myself i've learned a lot about myself i'm more patient and an hour layover at the station is just fine as is the five hour train journey three nights is a great amount of time to spend in most places building rest days yes we learned that and before traveling Take out all your money and your clothes, double the amount of money and half the amount of clothes. Yes, that's probably sensible advice. So this is part of that community, which is great. And then sometimes things make me laugh as to Steve Hall. I only regret the places I didn't get to, not the ones I visited. Well, maybe excluding Croydon and Luton. I've got to laugh. And so to conclude my formula for success, the interrail plus a bit of planning plus some flexibility plus a community can help provide a really great holiday and great experiences and great memories. So thank you for that. If you have any questions or comments or you want to share your experiences, feel free to do that in the comments field below, either on the YouTube channel or on the Facebook group that this is shared with. Thank you.